All right, everybody hear me? Okay, so I'm Christian Hardwick. I'm from the Utah Geological Survey. And as a part of my work there at the survey, we've been sort of slowly going through the state and determining which areas are good for uh, geothermal development. Um, this particular place, uh, the Tintic Valley, um, was something that was overlooked, and we actually found an old report from the 60s that our librarian had uh, been scanning these reports, and then they kick out the, the paper versions. And this one we found, they had kind of left, left it open-ended. Um, so this is, that kind of spurred the beginning of, of this work here. So this is a map of the geothermal resources in Utah, or potential resources. The main ones that we've sort of been working on here, this is the Black Rock Desert. Um, we've been doing that for maybe the last three and a half or four years. Um, we've got good heat flow, um, what appears to be a good reservoir in this area, and it's also known as a deep uh, sedimentary basin or a stratigraphic reservoir. All that means is that at depth, you've got temperatures that are ideal for geothermal uh, energy production, so 150 degrees C or higher. And those depths, we're looking about two to five kilometers. And these are also, these could be uh, blind systems or otherwise hidden systems that were uh, overlooked in the past. So Black Rock Desert, the Tintic Valley is actually sitting here. And this is an older map. And, if, and that's why there is nothing here. There's a couple of heat flow wells. Um, but it was just, it had been skipped. And that's what we're looking at here. So as far as these deep sedimentary basin uh, reservoirs. This is sort of the simplistic uh, approach of understanding what's going on. So you've got Fourier's law, which is the heat flow equation here. And if you've got a deep uh, sedimentary or a thick sedimentary cover over the basement rock for some uh, basal flux, uh, heat flux, if you've got basement rock directly to the surface compared to uh, sedimentary cover on top of that, you're actually going to get a different gradient. So here I've kind of plotted out in gray, this gray area here, 150 degrees C, which is sort of that target temperature. Um, but you can see this is the sedimentary cover um, in a basin. And this geotherm right here is the, uh, just the basement rock all the way to the surface. So you can see there's a significant difference between the two. Oops. OK, and so this is, the, this is the survey area. You can see in the state of Utah over here, um, heat flow data points. Um, which are from Edwards 2013, a master's thesis, and this Lovering and Morris, which is that 1965 report that was left open-ended. Up here in sort of the East Tintic Mountains, you see values anywhere from, you know, 60s, low 60s, up over 300 milliwatts per meter squared, which is significant. Um, if you look in most of the basin range, typically values are 80 to 90 milliwatts per meter squared. So these are three times that. Um, and if you go to the West Tintic Mountains, we do get up over 100. Black Rock Desert, we've already done some thermal modeling for this area. And it seems to be the background's about 85 to 90 milliwatts per meter squared. So it's still pretty high. And so our focus is the Tintic Valley right here. Part of that data set, and this is uh, my colleague's work, Stefan Kirby, was looking at all of the old uh, water data as well as more recently collected samples and looking at the chemistry and temperatures. So this is just sort of the distribution of those samples. There are some mines here, which is what that 1965 report was mainly focused on. Um, you see 29 samples, um, all of them collected within 250 meters of the water table. And the mine waters, which the mines sit here, this is uh, Utah Lake. It's approximately at that, the groundwater is at approximately that elevation, which makes sense. And you can kind of see that everything here, these are non-thermal waters. You might have some mixed waters. And then what he's calling thermal waters there. There's a Piper plot. You can see you've got the thermal, uh, thermal waters here, also those mine waters. And then also a couple of uh, interpretations with geothermometry. So we can get oops, you know, anywhere from 150 to 200 degrees C as you know, that equilibrium temperature. And I'll also add that the, the depths for the heat flow measurements um, were anywhere from 33 feet to 2,400 feet. So they're going down into the mines, drilling into the wall rock, and making temperature measurements, as well as using deep uh, boreholes. Now, 
think we've lost it. Okay, so here's, here's an isostatic gravity map of the area. Um, this is from Saltus and Yawkins, 1995, which is what they, Jackins, sorry, um, from 1995. And this is what they had done as sort of a regional scale uh, basin range. And at least for the state of Utah, we find that it's pretty good fit to the real data that we have and what we've been collecting um, in the past handful of years. Um, so we use that as sort of a basis to start off of. Um, for this uh, study, all these green triangles here, we've added about 150 stations. We've got maybe another 100 to go that we'll do in the spring as we fill this in and kind of uh, sort of uh, add to places where we don't have as good data coverage. All these measurements here were from a groundwater study that uh, is ongoing. And then all the black dots you can see here, that is the uh, PACES data set or the national um, data repository. So there wasn't a lot of coverage in this area before we started uh, this work. And really quick, if you look about uh, with the isostatic zero line is about here. And so you've got about, a, you've got a signal of 20 to 30 milligallus into that base, uh, basin, which is pretty significant. So thermal modeling, which is going to give us an idea if there's anything here that's, that we can uh, work with. Um, as far as setting this up, I mean, use a digital elevation model, a basement depth, which is also from uh, Saltus and Jackins. And was good. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, surface ground temperatures, we got this from uh, Edwards' thesis, um, computed for the state. Um, so you've got your model. This is a simplistic model. It's just a conductive model. You've got two layers. So it's going to be your difference between the surface elevations and your basement depth is going to give you that sedimentary layer. Everything else below that is going to be your uh, basement rock. And your boundary conditions are going to be uh, surface ground temperatures. And then below that, we use a uniform uh, basal heat flux, just to compare that um, for a conductive model. Here's some of the model parameters. It's just kind of a reminder of what that model looks like. Um, so K1 and K2. K1 is for the sedimentary uh, fill, and K2 is for the basement rock. And these values are typical of what we see in the area. We weren't as concerned about getting a large range as we have in the past, um, say with the Black Rock Desert. We did a larger spread. Um, but this one, we kept it a little bit tight. We were more concerned or uh, focused on what the basal flux, which is this QB. So we varied that from 80 up to the higher values that, we would, um, that were calculated, which comes out to you know, 207 models. This was done with Comsol Multiphysics. Um, it's an FEM program. I think to run these, it was probably about eight hours or so on a standard computer. So this is what the model space looks like. Um, it's a dynamic mesh, so it'll, it'll uh, incorporate all the topography um, instead of just having a simple surface, um, which is nice because you start to get very thin layers when the basement rock does come up to intersect with the surface. And then here's an example of just an output. This is actually the Black Rock Desert. Um, and then we can also do slices and all sorts of different things with heat flow and temperature. I will point out here, you kind of see that there's some blues that are down uh, in some of these slices or lower heat flows. What that is is heat flow refraction. So you're going to have a preferential flow of the heat flow because you've got a sedimentary fill that is insulating and the bedrock is more conductive uh, thermally. And so it's going to go around that. And so that's why you see these lower values within the basin and you get highs. And you can see that here. This is the basin. And then these reds here is where you've got the uh, refraction. So this is from one of the models that, that is a pretty good fit um, for this data as a first uh, pass. There's a scale bar here from 70 to 120 milliwatts per meter squared. Um, Tintic Valley is here. You can kind of see that low. And I've also plotted the heat flow uh, points on this map. And you can see that refraction that I was talking about. You've got those highs sort of along the, usually along the, the boundaries or the margins of the basin and the lows sort of through the basin. One of the things that they were interested in, I mentioned earlier, was the temperature. So 150 degrees C or 140 degrees C is something that, that is ideal for binary geothermal power. Um, but if you can get something around 50 degrees C, then you're getting into direct use. So that could be greenhouses, aquaculture, uh, district heating, um, so this is, that's also of interest. 
So if you look at these maps, these are depth slices um, from one to four kilometers. And even at 1K, everything is pretty much over uh, 50 degrees C. Um, and then you get down, once you get down to about 4K, that's when you start to approach the um, 150 degrees. But this is, a, this is a conservative model. And once we work through the, uh, all the new gravity data and redo that, then this will change because the geometries will change for the basin. And so that's one of the things we're going to continue to do with this work is update uh, the gravity model, which will change that basin depth of that geometry, which does affect those temperatures at depth and the heat flow uh, models, um, as well as adding new uh, boreholes and well temperature profiles. Now, there's not a whole lot out in this valley, and there's no constraints out in the middle because there aren't any deep wells. Most of them are just sort of on the margins. Um, as you can see, this is a very rural area. Um, at best. Um, updated water chemistry samples, we're working to get back into those mines so that we can get new samples and take a look at those and see if they match up with the, with the old reports. Um, future models will also add a heat source because we know that with, the, uh, with those mines in the East Tintic Mountains that it's an intrusion. And we're wondering if that's, you know, it's part of a, a mineral belt that kind of trends east-west through that area. So you've got the West Tintic Mountains, East Tintic Tintic Mountains, and we're wondering if that basin is also hot, or there's some other source or remnant source that's in there. And also, uh, fluid flow in the area um, is another thing that we'll look at, because of course this is just a conduction model. Thanks for your time. Well, we have time for a question or two. As the lights come up. Sue. We've, so with, oops, let me go back. Okay. <laughs> They're very dependent on this, and in fact, this, let's see if we get there. This is sort of what it's dependent on, so that thickness. So at, the deeper that you have that, or the thicker that fill on top of the basement, the higher that temperature is going to be. Your gradient will, your gradient is going to be the same. And, and of course, this is just 1D. So in 3D, you get the refraction, so it's a little bit different, but the concept is the same. But if you have a large, uh, a large basin, then it's more or less 1D out in the center. So as far as sensitivity, we, we haven't checked that out too much, um, mainly because we look at places where you've got at least two or three kilometers of sediments before we start running through this. Um, and we usually stay on the conservative side so that we're not saying, hey, we've got 200 degrees C, 200 degrees at two kilometers or something that's, you know, outrageous. So if you do find something that's higher in reality versus what we've modeled, then we're better. So we like to stay, you know, kind of pull the reins back a little bit. But. Yeah, so in the Black Rock Desert, um, so there's actually uh, IPP, which is a coal fire power plant, one of the large, one of the bigger ones. They're actually converting it to uh, uh, natural gas. That sits just sort of up here. And then you've got uh, one, two, three geothermal power plants. This is, this is known as the severe thermal anomaly. Um, Coe Ford is one that recently came online. It was set up in the 80s, and then they had run out of funding. And then just last year, Enel had been working out there, or took over, and that's online. I believe that's it. That's putting out 22 megawatts or so. And then Blundell Plant, and then another system here. So the main, the main thing about this is this is the interstate corridor that goes right through here. Um, adjacent from Milford, you've also got a wind farm. And out at Milford, there's Blundell Plant, which is 36 megawatts. So there's already infrastructure with power lines and everything. So this is kind of ideal. If we can develop this area, then it won't be too difficult to get that into the grid and, and go forward. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, the Intermountain Power Plant feeds Los Angeles, so you know it's a. <laughs> <laughs>